right, Yuja, would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Yep. All right, so as I mentioned before, uh, Yuja is our guest lecturer for today where he's going to spend um, up to 10 minutes to talk about a tool that compute um, mapper graphs on the fly. So remember, we spent quite a bit of time discussing the mathematical foundation as well as application of a tool called uh, Mapper Construction um, and it's coming from ReapGraph and so on. And there's several open source uh, software out there and one of them is develop developed by Yuja, like she's a primary developer for that and it's called Mapper Interactive. And I believe there's a, in the chat window, um, Yuja, can you put a link to the software? Yes, uh, give me one second. So yeah, I've put the link to the chat window. And All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and hi everyone, uh, I'm Miu Jia. So here is the uh, interface of this interactive tool. And let's go through a simple example to, sh to see how this tool works. So, First of all, let's uh, import this uh, 3D horse data. So this is the uh, 3D point cloud data of like a, a horse. So you can see the how this point cl cloud data looks like here. And after importing this data set, uh, the system will show like all the columns you can use to uh, do the clustering. So in this, in this case, you can both select more uh, columns or delete some columns. So here we just use the all three columns to do clustering. And after that, you can uh, do some um, parameter adjustment of the uh, clustering. So let's do this and after well, that, I'm going to quickly intersect, right? Those are okay. the parameters that is used for, um, for the DB scan algorithm. Yep. So yep. if you recall, there's multiple parameters associated with a mapper. In this case, uh, you just software only care about the uh, mappers, uh, mapper graph, which is one dimensional skeleton of the mapper construction. So when you think about what are the parameters you need to specify um, for the clustering, you need to specify the parameter. In, in this case, if you choose DP scan, then you need to choose a parameter associated with DP scan, where epsilon is uh, the size of the local neighborhood and mean sample is sort of the minimum density requirement for DP scan. And then you have parameters related to the number of intervals, amount of overlap, what is the filter function? And because this is a visualization tool, it's also you need to choose what is a color function. All right, go ahead, Yuja. And after uh, that, you can choose your filter functions. You can do either 1D mapper or 2D mapper. And let's do the 1D mapper first. So you can choose your uh, filter functions through the drop-down manual. And here we just do the, the average of the node values. And you can also adjust the, the number of intervals and the uh, rate of overlap here. After that, we can just compute the mapper. So here is the result of this uh, mapper graph, but it's still a little bit hard to understand. So let's do some coloring of the node first. In this case, the, the y value represents the head of the, uh, the head value. So if you look at here, it means like uh, from zero to 0.8. And let's just coloring it of the head value. And we can also size it use the same value. So um, in this case, uh, 
you can see this very small yellow nodes is actually represent the four feet of the horse because the feet is at the lowest head. And this very large uh, red nodes uh, is actually represent the head of this uh, horse because the head is uh, at the highest head in this case. So it's showing the uh, skeleton of this 3D horse. And after that, you can do some analysis uh, based on the mapper graph we have. For example, we can do uh, linear regression. We can also do PCA, like to com compare the result of PCA with our mapper graph. And you can also select uh, some nodes to compare their uh, average values of each column and, and to see like uh, within each node which uh, rows it contains. You can also do like select the entire cl cluster or select the path as long as uh, the, node, the nodes are connected. So um, I'm going to inject here quickly. Yep. So what happened is um, um, one thing that we did not dive into detail when we are talking about mapper construction is that if you are giving me a high dimensional point cloud, you know, if you think about the mapper algorithm, it is a sort of a fancier clustering algorithm of this high dimensional point cloud. And in a sense that is capturing how points are clustered and how those clusters are related with one another. So one sort of downstream analysis you can play with the mapper graph or the mapper construction is you can select subset of the high dimensional point cloud by selecting nodes in the mapper graph. So I could potentially just click on one node of the mapper graph and then apply things such as uh, linear regression. Um, what Yoja just demonstrated is there are multiple ways to select subsets of the mapper graph. Uh, for example, you can select a particular branch by using the select path, right? Yuja, if you can demonstrate, maybe you select one of the leg of the... Yeah. Um, yes. If you select one of the leg, right? Maybe this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can select... So in a sense that what, what we can do is now if you select a subset of the data points, you can look at the distribution of each dimension of points in each of the nodes that is involved in sort of this leg of the horse. And then you can also apply things like linear, uh, uh, linear regression, okay? So why is this interesting? Because part of this, um, if you think about linear regressor as a sort of as a model to feed the data, if I apply a linear uh, sort of regression for the entire point cloud, usually what you're doing is you're trying to find a single hyperplane for the entire point cloud, right? But now if I'm actually sort of decompose my data point into subsets, and then apply sort of linear regression for each of those subsets, then what you're doing is in some sense creating what's called a partition pay, a partition based regression model, or another way, it's a mixture of linear regressors. So in a sense that you can decompose your data into subset subsections, uh, perhaps in this case, based on the mapper graph and apply linear regression for each of the partition. Right? You kind of sort of study the trend of the data that is related to say a particular branch or particular area of my mapper graph. Okay, so that's something you can do essentially if you if you have a topological summary of my high dimensional data using things like mapper graph. Then what I would like to do is to do downstream machine learning uh, onto the entire point cloud or subset of the point cloud that is defined by the topological structure. Okay. All right, you just keep going. Yep, and in particular, if you selected a subset of nodes, all the analysis will be based on the, the selected nodes. For example, the, the PCA results will now be look like, like one leg of this, uh, of the whole data point. Actually, this looks like multiple legs. Yeah, I don't know why it should be only like, I, I think there's also part of the body. Remember, you choose part of the body. Yeah, yes, yes. Like this part. <laughs> and yeah. it, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. No, but I also suspect that maybe your leg has, I don't know, a ring, but it's in interesting to look at why this is the case. All right, yeah. keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay. And should I also show a uh, real data real data? Yeah, I would go, I would go with the cancer data set. Okay. Yeah. Mm, let's see. Sorry, let's see which one is the this one. Okay, so this data set is uh, like a, a breast cancer data set. Um, we will, uh, it contains like a I think this data set is only contains a few number of genes and also like the uh, whether the this uh, binary variable indicating like whether the patient is uh, dead or alive. And in this case, we only use the genes to compute to do the clustering. And let me go back to the to the uh, parameter settings. So we said epsilon equals 0.45 and main, main samples equals two. And then we also, also um, in this case, we can do like 2D mappers. So one of the, uh, Like we can do one of the filter function. Let's do the even death, and we can. And another, maybe we just do like the L two norm. So the purpose of this, uh, of of our. Uh, our goal of doing this uh, data set is to identify the subset of patient. Uh, so we are hoping to do some like, uh, to divide the entire data set into a few subgroups that uh, like in this situation, we, we have these two uh, disconnected clusters that one is for the, the alive the alive patient and another is for the dead patient. And maybe I will just uh, use the size to uh, to so we can we can like explore uh, like what's the difference between each of these two groups. Maybe I will just show the result in our paper like to, because this is, it is better than, than this. Well, the paper uses the entire data set than the smaller data set, right? But yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So this is actually the result we have. So we have like a few uh, clusters that with the uh, alive patient and a few clusters with the dead patient. And we are identifying. So I, I believe like the, the color function here is, um, let me see. Well, the left hand side of the picture is uh, is a label whether they survive or not of the cancer, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think the coloring function is like one of the genes. So usually, like if the if the value of this gene is uh, relatively large, that indicating the patient has high uh, probability to be alive, and if it is small, it it, it is. Uh, like 
more likely the patient is dead, but we just identify this branch with a subset of uh, patients that uh, has this uh, lower expression value of this gene, but they're still alive. So we can do some more analysis within this subgroup. All right. Okay. All right. So I think it's good uh, to stop the demo here. Okay. So um, there is multiple other tools. Uh, thank you, Yuja. So there's multiple other tools that is used uh, for um, for sort of mapper, and then they have or have sort of very different strengths. Um, and so uh, mapper interactive is actually one of the newer tool that our, our our team has just developed, and it has more of interactive capabilities and computing mapper. Uh, graphs on the fly. There's also some other tools also in the same category of open sourced uh, mapper uh, algorithm implementations that later on we might uh, be exposed to some of those as well. So, okay, so that's the first component of today's lecture. The second component is actually I want to describe a little bit over and thank you Yuja for, for your time. Um, my second component today is I would like to go over quickly uh, the description of the first project, which is just released. Uh, so let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. All right, can, can folks see? Good. All right, so um, I'm just gonna describe this quickly. And if you have some questions, uh, please ask now. And this is released today. Oh, it's released last night, but it's today, and it's going to do on March fourth. Uh, so remember, March the week following that is uh, is where I would call the mental uh, break or <laughs> sort of our uh, not so official uh, spring break in the sense that we don't have class on March eighth. Um, but this is due before that, so hopefully you can get this done and kind of have a relaxed week. All right, it's not very complicated in a sense that this is a project I would like to test your sort of understanding and your ability to compute persistent homology. So the overview, it has, it's, um, it's, it's a mini project, meaning that the final score is 20% of your final grade. Um, it has a few components to it. The first part should be very easy. Um, basically, I would like you to compute barcodes slash persistent diagram of, uh, of several synthetic data sets. Okay, so the software itself is called Ripser. If I have time today, we'll go through a quick demo of how to get it installed and get it to run. Um, but what it does is if you provide a point cloud and or if you provide a pairwise distance matrix, it's going to compute the barcode for you. Okay. So the first part is to compute barcodes for some synthetic data set. And the second part is to compute the barcode for an image data set. So I'm providing some sort of minimum guidelines to how exactly you're going to do for the part two, because I would like to explore the data. And the hope is that I'm kind of simulate a real world simulation uh, that I don't give you a user manual for the new data set and you have some freedom to how you would like to explore it. And, and it's also part of a hack where I give you here is the open source package. And you know, maybe you need to modify the code, maybe not, depends on how you want to proceed. Maybe you have to write a module that does the data uh, uh, wrangling at the beginning, okay? Which is exactly part two of this project. So what you're going to do is you're going to record the persistent barcode in the form of a TXT file. So for a particular data set, once you run it, it's going to output and you're going to talk about the birth and death of each of the bar. Um, you're going to provide a screenshot of your output and also you're going to provide source code. Um, and I think Faye has an announcement that for the project, it's, it's, it's going to be submitted through Gradescope, but it's going to have two components. One component is the PDF of your report, report of the mini project. And second part is a zipped file of your source code. We do that because then she can directly comment based on your report. Uh, so she can mark onto the PDF and so on, right? And um, so ultimately your report is going to consist of the screenshots together with the PDF description, and you are going to have the barcode and source code in a zip file. And then Faye will make that clear over a uh, announcement on Canvas to exactly the format she wants you to do for submitting through Grayscope. But 
if you look at sort of the pipeline for TDA or topological data analysis is you have some sort of data. And in most cases, what we have been talking about so far has been point cloud data. Um, but you can also be graphs. It could also be images in the second part in this project is actually images. And now what you're going to do is you're going to construct this filtration of simplicial complexes in the form of uh, point cloud data, especially for RIPSER. The simplicial complex it's construct is actually a uh, via Torres RIPS complex which is something we described before. And once you compute this filtration, meaning that each of the simplex has an, uh, an ordering attached to it, you compute uh, the persistent homology, which comes out as a barcode representation from the RIPSER software. Um, and of course, once you have this barcode, the downstream analysis is things like machine learning and visualization and so on and so forth. So what is the data? The first data is already for part one is some synthetic data set. One is called octa, one is called cylinder. Of course, cylinder is pretty obvious because it's a point cloud sample from a cylinder. Octa, I would like you to try to visualize a point cloud, you know, and see what it is. But both of them has interesting dimension zero and dimension one homology. Okay. So the second part of the data set is the MPEG-7 image data set, and here's a link to it. And here's some example of this data set. It's basically the silhouette of a bunch of shapes, okay? And what I would like to do is to figure out a way to compute the persistent homology of this image data set. Okay, for the part one, um, you know, I already provide you some synthetic data set and you can even play with more synthetic data set. But the idea is I would like to, for both of those data set, there's a particular type of um, pers persistence feature I would like to return. Um, I would like you to return them um, as sort of the bars in the barcode. And I want you to compute for both of them dimension one persistence uh, homology, okay? And you know, give you a hint that Octa is going to consider uh, contains four very large loops in their data set. Okay, and then there are some very small loops also as well. So in total, Octa contains eight loops in the data set. Um, for of course, for a cylinder, it at least have one loop because the tunnel of the cylinder. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking for is basically a basic usage of the software Ripser um, and to be able to export them in sort of a text file, right? So play with a synthetic data set. The second part is that for this image data set, I would like to take 10 sample images, one from each class, and I would like to define what's called a filtration for each image. I'll make that clear very soon. And once you get a filtration, you kind of want to represent this image um, maybe as a point cloud, okay? And you want to compute the barcode in dimension zero and return the barcode again as a TXT file. So part of the second part require a bit of data processing, meaning that what are the potential uh, ways to construct a filtration? Remember the image, oh, well, there's a compiling thing. Anyway, there's a, there's a, there's a reference towards the end. I'm going to update this file. Um, there is a particular paper. Well, there's first option is you have, if you look at this point cloud, right? You have a silhouette of the shape. So one way you can convert each of image to a point cloud is to just sample points at its boundary, okay? So basically try to extract the points that separate the black from the white pixel, okay? So you have a silhouette point cloud, and then you can compute sort of the persistent homology of this point cloud, okay? That's option number one, which is slightly easier option. But if you want to challenge yourself, the second way to do this is to say, okay, I am not only going to, well, I mean, the second way to do this is to say, okay, I have a point cloud, but instead of, computing a filtration using the point cloud directly, I am going to put a height function on this point cloud, okay? So what does that mean? I'm going to take sort of, because it's a two dimensional image, I can take a height direction in a disk, okay? In a circle. So meaning that I can define a height function that is say vertically, and I can define a function that is horizontally. I can also define a height function that is forming 45 degree, okay? So for each of those height functions, you can also construct 
of filtration of it. And hopefully soon in not today's lecture, later I'll tell you how the, that filtration is constructed. It's very much based on um, what's called sublevel state filtration. Basically, I'm going to look at how the points grow as I'm, I'm looking at all the points that is below a certain threshold of my height function. But the high level picture is for giving a shape like this, even in any of those point cloud or a shape, I'm going to take a collection of high direction defined in the point cloud. For each of this high direction, there is going to be a persistent diagram. So now for each of the shape, I'm going to get a collection of persistent diagrams. Okay, that was a second option. Of course, the third option, which I haven't mentioned, is instead of getting the silhouette of the points, I can also convert this image to another point cloud, which is only the point sample from either the white region or the black region. Okay, so that's another way to convert this to a point cloud representation. I can just take this image and I can say, okay, I'm only going to sample points from the black background. Okay, or I only sample points from the white uh, foreground. Okay, so that's another way to turn it into a point cloud and try to perform analysis. Okay, and then last bit, what people can do, which is not very effective in this case, um, because this is just a black and white image, but if the image has sort of more color to it, then you can treat the whole image as a scalar function and apply persistent homology to it. But that's not recommended for this particular data set, because it's only really, if you're thinking about values, it's usually just have two values, right? Let's say zero for white and one for black or other way around. So these are only two scalar values. So in a sense that if I just treat this image as a scalar function, uh, it's it, it, and computing the sublevel set of this scalar function is not going to be very effective because it's not a, not a continuous function. All right. So, okay. So second part, as I mentioned, there's a reference here, which is basically what's called deep learning with topological signature, okay? So if you actually look at this, what I described earlier, it is basically taking different direction of a shape and computing the barcode. It's actually what's called persistent homology transform. It's a particular technique to say that, okay, if I want to characterize a shape, instead of just looking at, you know, the behavior of the point cloud itself, I want to look at the behavior of it with respect to a collection of function defined on it. And happen to be the collection function I care about is all the direction I can model. Right, so in 2D, I have a direction surrounding a circle where I can kind of rotate my angle to define which direction I'm defining at the height of this, uh, of this shape, and I'm going to get the persistent homology with respect to that direction. In 3D, if I have a 3D model, then I'm going to sample all sorts of high direction um, that is sampled from a sphere. And if I sample the argument under the persistent homology transform is that if I actually, there's a really interesting reconstruction problem surrounding it, which is if I have a particular 3D model and I take enough directions to compute the persistent barcode, if there's enough of those directions, then I can argue I can reconstruct the original shape. All right. This is very similar to the idea that, you know, to do like sort of image reconstruction, uh, sort of 3D model reconstruction from images. So if I have a 3D model, let's say my water bottle, right, and I go around with a different camera angles, if I take enough angles of the camera to take a collection of images, then there's argument that with all those 2D images, I can reconstruct the 3D object. This is actually similar, but from the perspective of persistent homology. The argument is if I take enough direction, high direction, to compute the persistent barcode, and if I collect enough of them, all those persistent barcode combined together, it's going to recover my original point cloud of the shape. Okay. So the second part, like if you take this option, you are basically looking at uh, how do you actually, you know, apply this kind of thing to get a collection of signatures from those image things. So if you want to challenge yourself to go with option number two, then you want to read the paper, which also come with the code. Okay. So so in a sense that for the second part of the mini project, I give you more options of how would you like to proceed with the image data set. And, and part of that is really rely on how do you process the image to turn into a form that is usable by say Ripser or by the software associated with, uh, with the a deep learning paper. 
What does that paper do actually? Once you get a 3D shape and you take all different directions, you get the persistent diagram. What they do is they use those persistent diagram associated with a shape. Now each shape is associated with a collection of persistent diagram. They are using that for shape classification. Okay. So if you imagine in the small data set, if you have this small data set here, one option is to say, if I expand this data set to a larger collection, for example, all sort of images that is from, you know, I don't know, the image of apple, different apples or image of horse, image of deer, then the idea is, can I use those persistent diagram for classification tasks, okay? So in some sense that this mini project is essentially the sort of pre-processing for downstream uh, classification tasks. And then you are using topological sort of persistent diagram as topological features that can be used as an input uh, to downstream analysis. Okay. All right. Any questions on the project? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, feel free to use Piazza um, to ask questions uh, about the project. And my recommendation is to start as soon as you can. You know, this is not a project you want to wait until the day it's due uh, to start. To start. Okay. All right. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw that Ripser is uh, C plus mm plus. -hmm. Um, are we so are we to use C plus plus for so project? Part of this part of so I believe if I if I remember correctly, Ripser does have a Python interface. I believe, and maybe I'm wrong, but you should correct me. Um, most part of this project, you can pretty much use Ripser out of box. You see what I mean? However, if you do end up having to modify it, feel free to ask me or Faye if you have any issues. Okay. And in in some sense, part one, I'm 100% sure you can just run Ripser out of box. For part two, once you have done, so there is some coding you need to do for part two, precisely how you pre-process the image data set to a format that Ripser can take. So that's pretty much, you can stay, you, you can pretty much avoid modification of uh, Ripser's code. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's kind of what I was asking about was just for the pre-processing yeah. step, like can we yeah. use yeah. Python or? You can do Python, right? I would actually suggest Python. If I think majority of people know more about Python nowadays. Uh, that, but, uh, but yeah, so part of part two is a pre-processing stage and you can use any language you want, right? You just want to pre-process the image data into a form that is acceptable by Ripser. And do you care about like seeing that pre-processing script or yes, can we just say, okay. Yeah. So, so um, part of the, yeah. So part hey, of, yeah, as I know ahead. so far, Ripster has a, a Python library, but only include a subset of API that the actual Ripster actually uh, have. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I would encourage people to look into that, right? Yeah. So yeah, so I kind of remember it has a Python interface, but it might not have all the capabilities. Uh, but yeah, but if you want to stay pure with Python, it's doable. Um, yeah, so, so as part of submission, what we're asking for is you're going to submit a report that includes screenshot, description of what you did, and also the source code. And usually um, for all the project is that you have to provide enough detail that Faye and I can reproduce your result, meaning that your code has to be ex executable. I mean, in some sense that, you know, if it's Python, we can run our machine, right? So in a sense that uh, we are looking for code that is usable. I mean, it doesn't have to be like, you know, uh, production quality, but it has to be enough for us to re reproduce your results. That would be the requirement for the code submission. I know there's a few of you who is not a CS background, um, so feel free to reach out uh, to get help from me and Faye. But I would say for this first mini project, a lot of it is about using existing tools. There's a question in the chat. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can there's hear you. It's not very loud, but go ahead. Oh, there's a question in the chat asking about the um, the colored image that you talked about. So to clarify option four, for colored image processing, did you mean sort of like so oh, with, with the RGB? Oh, no, no, no. So that, that is just my comment. It's, it's not related to this project. For this particular mini project, 
I specify you are going to download the image from the MPG, MPEG-7 image data set, which is black and white images. I'm saying that if you actually want to apply the same type of framework to color images, then you can have sort of RGB images and then you can process them slightly differently than you do with the black and white images. But that's not part of the mini project one. Yeah, I think I think that um, Sun Hoon knows that. It's just he's asking, is it sort of like R square plus G square plus B square for each pixel, and you then can, somehow you can accumulate the scalar function values? There's few ways to do it, right? You basically want to convert a colored image into a scalar field, and there's multiple ways to do it. Depends on sort of which channel do you care most. Does that make sense? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the project? All right, so usually, according to our class syllabus, the project is due on the, on the day that is stated and it's due before the class starts. Um, but start earlier and start asking questions. And especially for those who don't have, um, you know, th this will be a good starting point uh, for you to get familiar with some of those tools. All right, so the other part today, you know, I'm going to, is a little bit out of order, but um, let me since we're talking about tools, I want to mention that um, you know there's a lot of open source tools out there. So the ones that uh, you have seen today, uh, Mapper Interactive, is one tool that compute macro graph. The Ripser is another is another tool, open source tool that compute um, uh, uh, persistent diagram, but based on uh, Viatoris Rips filtration of the point cloud. Um, there's a history of open source tools in computational topology and, uh, and topology data analysis over and over the past five years, I would say there is actually really a large collection of them. Uh, here is an incomplete list. Um, there is Java Plex, uh, which I believe is one of those Java implementations of computing persistent homology. There's TDAR which is a R implementation. Um, and especially for people in statistics and math, uh, people like to use, use R. So TDAR is a R package for topological data analysis, especially persistent homology computation, but it also contains some other statistical tools inside. There's a uh, Dionysus, which is one of those earlier tools also implemented in uh, C, C++ for uh, persistent homology computation. It also contains some other form of persistent homology, including zigzag um, and so on. There's Goody, uh, Diva, and uh, FAT. Those are, uh, Goody is an open source tool that contains a lot of collections of topological data analysis tools, uh, including persistent homology, but it also include things like discrete, I believe, uh, uh, it's also include uh, other tools that is go beyond simplicial complexes, like what we call qubit simplices, which is a different type of filtration of point cloud data. Um, and it's actually supported by a really large group. Um, DeFi and FAT are the tools to compute persistent homology uh, in a scalable way. I mean, to be fair, Mapper Interactive also contains a few speed up that we have to apply to uh, point cloud data with a large scale. When I say large scale, I'm talking about 1 million points. Okay, so 1 million points and beyond. If you play with Ripser as part of your project, one of the things that's going to come back and you're going to realize when you are doing that project is that depends on how many points you sample from the image, it might significantly impact uh, the computation. Your, your laptop computer might run out of, out of memory uh, in some sense within a few thousands points. A part of that is because when you're con constructing the simplicial complex, um, even with a few thousand points, your simplicial complex might have one million elements. Um, and uh, you know, later in this lecture, we're going to go over a very simple example of computer persistent homology by hand. And you can see that even with three points in my data set, I'm going to have a matrix that is you know up to uh, up to a, 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 a quite large and also that in the worst case scenario, the persistent homology algorithm is n cubed, meaning that n is the number of simplices and the algorithm runs in n cubed worst case, uh, which is not a very scalable uh, thing in the worst case. However, in practice, if you have n simplices, the, the typical practical, uh, uh, practical runtime is roughly linear in the number of simplices. But again, even if you have 1 million simplices, the runtime is still going to suffer. 
All right, so those tools are the ones that is based on essentially uh, scalable computations. So I want to go through here. Of course, this is going to screw up my link. Um, oh, okay. Hold on one second. So there's two link I provided over there. Oh, I think there's a space. Hopefully this is not okay. So here is uh, an incomplete collection done by one of my uh, friend and uh, collaborator uh, talking about all the open source software options. Okay, and and there is the mapper algorithm. Uh, mapper interactive isn't there yet because it's just the most recent tool. There is a first one, which is Ayasti, which is their tool of uh, sort of commercial grade tool using mapper uh, computation. Uh, there's Skit Kit TDA, which is part of uh, Kepler mapper, oh, which include Kepler mapper uh, that include again a uh, sort of Python slash uh, HTML. Um, version of, uh, of, of constructing uh, a mapper from point cloud data. Uh, there's TDA mapper and there's a Python mapper, which was one of those earlier tools in computing mapper. Persistent homology, you have a really long list of computation. We just mentioned RIPSER, which is what you're going to use for the first project, but there's also all this uh, different tool set that, um, that, uh, that that includes persistent homology computation. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is Gyoto TDA, this part. This is also one of this newer package that is developed by uh, folks at EPFL. Um, and then uh, it also contains quite a bit of capabilities, not just persistent homology, but also include mapper implementation as well. Um, so Perseus, right, Perseus right here, this is the one that is fairly scalable. And of course, the one that is very scalable um, is the distributed version of persistent homology computation, which is DIFA. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, so there is also some vectorization, which is something we're going to talk later down the road is, um, you know, we kind of had a small taste of of how topological data analysis interface interface with machine learning down the road, we're going to talk about uh, approaches that takes a persistent diagram and convert it into vectors such that it's easier to be uh, used as input uh, to machine learning algorithms such as you know uh, SVM and uh, and neural networks. Okay. So there's multiple ways of converting a persistent diagram into a vectorized form and depends on what you want to make use of. So there are certain forms where you convert to, it's much easier for what's called kernel-based machine learning methods. So uh, we're going to describe that later down the road is how do you convert persistent homology information into vector. And then there's of course other computations. For example, later on when we talk about the distances between persistent diagram, um, is what's called HERA. So if I have persistent diagram, one thing to do is to compute the distances between persistent diagram, right? If I'm using persistent diagram as a feature for things like classification or regression, I need to be able to measure distances between those feature vectors represented as persistent diagram. Then there is distance measures between them. Uh, for example, bottleneck distance and wash distance distance. So the idea is actually going to compute those distance fast. And HERA is a uh, a package that help compute those distances between persistent diagram. All right. Okay, so that's that for some of the open source packages. And later on, you're going to see some of this. And what you just saw earlier is the Mapper Interactive demo by Yuja. And then there is a paper that goes with it if you want to um, you know, kind of look at more data sets and uh, or examples. And then the data set that it described in the paper is also part of the distribution of the software. So you should you should try to sort of play with those high dimensional data set and to kind of get familiar uh, with the Mapper algorithm. The other one I do want to mention, right? Um, 
this was an earlier tool that is using uh, sort of our implementation of, uh, of, of uh, topological data analysis. And then there is information on how to install. And then there are also tutorials how to play with it if you are a fan of R. But part of this is that this is a, just a screenshot of it. On the right hand side, the left hand side is a code, but right hand side, what you see is I have two point cloud, one a big circle and a small circle with point cloud sample from those two circle. And what you see is the persistent diagram in the bottom. Remember, you know, when I described the barcode, it's talk about birth time and death time of each bar. The persistent diagram is alternative way of encoding it where the black points here corresponding to the zero dimensional persistent homology where the circle, uh, sorry, rectangle, red rectangle corresponding to one dimensional persistent homology. So there is sort of two points in this diagram, two sort of, rect uh, sorry, not rectangle, triangle in this diagram that corresponding to two of those circles, right? So those are one dimensional homological features uh, that is captured. So of course, depends on the distance of this points to the diagonal, it tells you how persistent it is, which corresponding to how sort of significant or important that feature is. You see those two uh, triangles that is off the diagonal, the one that is closer to a diagonal corresponding to the lower left corner of the small circle versus other one corresponding to the big circle. So in a way that this loop is corresponding to this and this loop corresponding to this. So this is just a quick demo of uh, of how how would you see from you know the interface of TDAR, which is one of those tools that compute persistent homology. Okay, any questions? Okay. If there's no question, let's get back to a little bit left over when we are talking about computing persistent homology. What I want to do today is at least to go over one example of computing persistent homology by hand. All right, so what do I want to do? So let's do a quick recall over what we learned from last lecture. All right, so let's start with the- Hey, do you want to take a break? I wanted to say this. Oh, yes, over. yes, let's take a quick break. Uh, let's take a five minutes break. We'll come back at 10.03. Okay, and feel free to ask questions if you have any.
Okay, so let's uh, resume. I actually had a question yeah. about the the last graph that you showed before. It. Which one? It would be impossible for anything to be under that curve, right? Which graph are we talking about? Um, the last one um, with the homology. It was in your other set of slides. Sorry. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you were saying um, how close things are to the line basically shows their life. But just so I'm reading this right, it's impossible for anything to be under that line. Um, in the current construction we have, uh, uh, no. Um, but <laughs> a lot of answer in this direction is not absolute because what we're uh, in uh, this lecture, uh, actually in the semester, we're going to mostly talking about the sort of the classic sublevel set filtration or distance filtration. And in most cases, the sort of the points are basically in this uh, upper left triangular area. Okay. Because what happened is that for each of the point in here, it has a burst time and a death time. And usually burst time is smaller or equal to death time, right? You have to bore first before you die. However, yeah. it depends on how people doing the filtration, there's something called extended uh, persistent homology. And what that looks at is sort of looking at the filtration for sublevel cell filtration and the super level filtration uh, and so on. And then in that case, that gives rise to a persistent diagram, which has point in here. But that's not something we're going to cover uh, in the lecture, but it's actually described in the textbook. OK. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's get back to um, the important definitions. Um, so, so again, I was warn you that those are sort of algebraic topology uh, first chapter in like a crash course. Uh, but we're going to sort of spending a few more uh, lectures to go over a few examples. Hopefully this will become clear. Um, so there's a concept we went through last lecture. What is a cycle, right? A cycle is a one that has is a, 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 a one cycle is a one chain with empty boundary. So if I take a boundary of it, it's zero. Okay, so there is this sort of what is a kernel of a function. The kernel of a function is basically everything that map to zero. So if I want to have a picture of it, if this is a function going from its domain to its range, then there is a subset of element, let's say in the domain that map to zero. Okay, let's say this is my subset. Let's say A, A is a subset of my domain that through this function, it all map to zero. Then what we say is A is equal to the kernel of the function. So the notation here, when I say it's a kernel of a function, it means that it mapped to zero through the function. It's part of the points in the domain that map to zero. That means it's a kernel. Now there's a definition of an image. Now remember I have, again, you know, let's say my, my, my domain, let's say for this example is integer. My codomain is integer. Remember I said my function is two times this, right? So I say, okay, so if I have point one, point two, where does it map to? One is going to map to two in here, two is going to map to four in here, and so on and so forth. So basically everything that is mapped in here through the function f going from the input to the output, meaning that my this set here, let's say it's b, B is a subset of the integer and B is the image of my function, meaning that it's all the possible output uh, from the input, right? So I take all the possible input, I map it to a possible, uh, uh, so it's all possible, how to say values uh, my function can take uh, in the range of the function or codomain of the function. So in this particular example, if my input, if my domain and codomain are both uh, integers, then the image from this function as I defined are all the even uh, integers, right? All the even numbers are in my image. 
Okay, so this is kernel image, but by definition, remember a cycle is a one with empty boundary. So because of this definition, if I take the boundary of it, it's equal to zero, that means it's a kernel of, of, of this boundary map. And the, the P boundary is a chain who is a boundary of the P plus one chain. So a one boundary is a boundary of a two chain. So a one boundary is the boundary of a linear combination of triangles. And by definition, they are the image of the previous map. And because of this, right, remember, I say that the boundary, so boundary is an image, a boundary group is, is an image of the boundary map. And a cycle group is a kernel of the boundary map. So that becomes the picture here. For example, if I focus on the yellow BP, which is the um, p-dimensional boundary group, it is the image of CFP, is the image of the P plus one chain group, right? That's the definition. And now if I look at for example, Z of P. Well, let me erase this. If I focus on the Z of P, remember the definition. This is all the kernel of the boundary map. So because it all matched to zero, right? So now what's happening is the homology group right here is the sort of the quotient operation or module operation between Z of P and B of P. What does that mean? It's sort of, it's a homology. In this case, let's say P is equal to one. I care about the loops, one dimensional homology. The one dimensional homology are the ones who are cycle who are um how to say they are cycle group right remember they are the p-dimensional cycles but they are not boundaries so this quotient a uh, module operation is to say that i care about an uh, element in my one-dimensional homology group if it is it is so h h1 is equal to z1 modular b1 it says that it's a one dimensional homology group if it's a one dimensional cycle, but not a boundary. So when you take the modular operation is to say that I'm going to ignore part of my elements in this group that is boundary. So what does this mean? If I just focus on Z1, sorry, if I'm just focusing on dimension one homology to be Z1, modular B1. So I want to say it's one cycle that's not a boundary. So from an English language perspective, what does that mean? So first of all, it has to be a one cycle. So let's say I have a one cycle that is a linear combination of edges. So I have one, two, plus one, three, plus three, four, plus two, four. Okay. So this is, this is a one cycle because if I take the boundary of this, this is equal to zero. Okay, so this is a one cycle. But the question is that is this a boundary? So it's not a boundary because there does not exist a linear combination that is C2. C2 means that it does not exist a linear combination of triangles such that the boundary of this linear combination of a triangle is equal to the current one dimensional cycle. So it's not, in a sense, it's not a boundary of a linear combination of triangles. However, now if I give a second example, if my chain is one, two plus one, three plus two, three, we know, you know, in this case, C, so in this particular case, let me go back. This, this first example, C is in Z1 because it's a, um, 
it's it's a linear combination it's a, it's a linear combination of edges and it is a cycle but then it's not uh it's not a boundary so what that mean that means c is part of this homology group so what is the picture looks like is that this yellow linear combination bound a tunnel what where does it where is the tunnel it's right here because there's an empty space that corresponding to the one dimensional tunnel or one dimensional homology group. Now, if I use the same example, except for a different chain, where I have linear combination of one, two, two, three, one, three. Now what's happened is that this chain is Z1, which means it is a boundary. Oh, sorry, it's a, it's a cycle because if I take the boundary of it is equal to zero, right? So that's the first part. And now it also means that there exists a C prime, which is equal to the triangle one, two, three, that's part of C2, such that the boundary of C prime is equal to C. So what does this mean? This means there exists a linear combination of triangle, in this case, it's just one triangle, whose boundary is my current chain. So that means this implies my chain is part of uh, a boundary also. So this means that this, because C is in Z1 and C is in B1, this implies C is not a, a dimension one homology. And from the picture it's obvious is because it's not bounding a tunnel because the tunnel is already filled uh, by a triangle. Okay, so again, you know, there is this picture here, but the most important part is really in if I were going to picture what does my homology looks like, what I'm getting is, you know, my p dimensional homology group are the ones who are part of the p dimensional cycle group modulate the p-dimensional boundary group, which is basically corresponding to the cycles, which are not boundaries. Okay, so those corresponding to essentially those tunnels we were describing about, but this applies to any dimension. So far, I have been using dimension one because it's easier to explain. So if I were going to have a picture view, anything that is in the cycle group, but not in the boundary group is my homology group. So this is sort of this yellow region now corresponding to uh, sort of the, the elements in my homology group. All right, so, so once we have this concept, there's what's called the rank of it. In some sense, the rank captures how many independent um, tunnels do I have. Uh, Okay, so how many independent elements do I have? So part of this is that if I have a chain, let's see the first chain, which is one, two, plus two, four, plus three, four, plus one, three. I have another chain, which is two, three, plus three, four, plus um, two, three, three, four, and two, four, okay? So let's say the first chain is all those yellow edges. And then the second chain is all this pink edges. My point is that those two one dimensional chain of both, both of them, both C1 and C2 are part of the dimension one homology group, meaning that they are both bounding a tunnel, right? One dimensional homology are tunnels. They both bound the tunnels. But even by just looking at this picture, you see that they are bounding the same tunnel, which means that they are actually not independent from each other. So in this particular example, right, the rank, well, actually, I already wrote here, the rank of the dimension one homology is actually uh, one, because there's only one independent cycle or sorry, tunnel in this space, okay? But of course, if I give you a different space, you know, this is something you want to think about, and we'll come back to this example. Okay? 
this is my more complicated space. In this particular example, it's going to tell you when you compute the rank of the dimension one homology, this is an example where rank of dimension one homology group is equal to two, meaning that there's two independent tunnels there. There's this one, and then there's this one, okay? But of course, there's multiple uh, linear combination of edges that describe this tunnel. Same thing as what I just described, you can have, you know, this one describing the first tunnel and this one describing the second tunnel. And then you can have this one describing the linear combination of both tunnels. Okay, those are all elements in my dimension one homology group. So with the remaining time today, um, so, so again, we're gonna come back to it. Um, the rank of a group is sort of the generators and we're hopefully going to give more examples of it. But this is sort of the mathematical notation of it. Idea is I want to look at independent tunnels in my dimension one homology. But what I would like to do is to go over one example of computing persistent homology. Now, there's three examples, but I'm just going to go over for one of them. Okay. So because this helps with your understanding of how to use Ripser down the road. So here is an example of a simplicial complex that has three vertices and three edges, and there's no triangle. And I'm going to label the three vertices to be vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, and the three edges to be edge four, edge five, edge six. That's it. And then the numbering of it also corresponding to what I call the filtration, meaning that when does those vertices and edges appear? So I will say vertex one appear at time one, vertex two appear at uh, time two, vertex three appear at time three, edge four appear at time four, edge five appear at uh, time five, edge six appear at, edge, uh, at time six. And then this is exactly, this is what's called the boundary matrices, which is basically each of the column is a simplex ordered by the time they appear. Each row are the vertices and simple, uh, the, uh, vertices and edges, again, ordered by the time they appear. And then there is going to be an entry of a one if a particular uh, vertex is a boundary of, uh, of the edge. So if a particular rows are part of the boundary of a particular column. So this is a very simple uh, filtration, as I see is what's a called filtration is if you have a collection of simplices that they appear in some ordering, and that is my filtration. Of course, there's additional constraint that my boundary of a simplex has to show up before the simplex itself. But in this case, you know, all the vertices show up before the edges. Okay. So the first of all, I'm going to look at the boundary of vertices. Well, there are zero boundaries, so there's nothing in the entry of my uh, of my of my matrix. And here. I'm going to look at what is the boundary. So what is the boundary of my edge four? Okay, anyone help me? What is the boundary of my edge? It's one and two vertex. Exactly. It should be the vertex one, vertex two. I'm using this quotation mark just to say that those are labels also on there. So because the boundary of four is one, two, so you have an entry of one and an entry of one right here. And then the boundary of edge five is, right, the vertex two and vertex three. So there's corresponding one in those entry. Same thing, the boundary of the last one, the boundary of six is one and three. That is my boundary matrix. Now, what I would like to compute is if I go through this filtration, right, the vertex appear and disappear, when does homology, dimension one homology appear? Uh, when does dimension zero homology appear, okay? So before we go through the computation, I wanna go through this example by itself. Okay, I'm gonna use a space on the left corner. What is my time? So I'm going to add, uh, what is the sequence of my thing? It's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So if I'm thinking about my time, at time, the first, at time one, vertex one shows up. 
At time two, vertex two shows up. At times three, vertex three shows up. Okay. And then at time four, the edge shows up. The edge four shows up. Edge five shows up. Edge six shows up. Okay. So this is what I call the filtration that every single time there's some simplex that shows up in the simplicial complex. So now my question for you, if I'm looking at zero dimensional homology, okay? When are the components born? You know, without computation, I just want to look at this filtration, okay? When does component born? Equals one, two, three. Yeah, so there's a component born at time one. There's a component born at time two. There's a component born at time three. So you're right. When do they die? Four, five, and six. Exactly. So of course, now you have to make a decision, you know, like which one do I die, right? So if there's an edge connecting the component one, two, remember the rule is the youngest rule. So the youngest one dies first, okay? So between one and two, it when one and two merge, that means the component two merge into component one, then the two component dies. So this is two, four, okay? Now at time five, the component represented by one is merged with a component represented by three, but three is the younger one. So I say three dies, okay? And then the component that is com represented by the vertex one never dies. So this is a dimension one homology, a dimension, a dimension zero uh, persistent homology, okay? Now, what is a persistent homology in dimension one? When does a loop appear, a tunnel appear? Six. Six. Exactly. When does it disappear? Never. Sorry, go ahead. Do you say never? Yeah. yeah, never. Exactly. This are now my barcode, okay? Because the dimension zero barcode tells me there's component die at two, disappear at four, or born at two, disappear at four. There's a component born and three disappeared five. There's a component that never dies. And then in dimension one person homology is there, there's a, there's a tunnel that is born at time six. Uh, it neither never dies because I never put a triangle in there to kill it off. So, but how do I do this through a matrix operation? Okay, so I want to now do a matrix operation and I'm gonna do this example for today. And then we're gonna go through a few more examples uh, next time, but feel free to try to challenge yourself with the further examples. The, 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 the operation of persistent homology computation can be completely encoded by column operations. And the column operation goes from left to right. So I start from left, okay? I'm just gonna operate on this boundary matrix here. I start from the first column, it's empty. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything, I don't have to do anything. Now I'm going to finally arrive at a non-empty column. And what I'm gonna do is looking at the lowest one. So the lowest one, right, of this column is the one I just put in a square. And I'm gonna to look to the left of it to see if there's any other one there. If there's no such one, I don't do anything, I'm done, okay? Now I'm going to the next column. I'm gonna look at the lowest one. The lowest one is right there, this entry, and I'm gonna to look to the left. There's nothing conflicting with it, I'm done. The last column is this one. So this is where things become interesting. I look at the lowest one and I look to the left. And what's happening is that there is a one also to the left of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this column to the current column because I detected, you know, a one there. So I'm going to add the column five 
to column six. So what do I do in term of operation? When I say I'm going to add column five to column six, I'm going to add, basically move the value from five to six and add them. So I basically add one to this here and another one to here, but then it's one plus one that is equal to zero. All right. So basically now what I have is once I add five, the fifth column to the sixth column, I have canceled out this lowest one right here. So I get a, I end up getting one, one, zero in this column. Now I'm going to check again, the lowest value of this. Okay. But because, you know, I already operated over five. So for the time being, I'm going to ignore the fifth column, but I'm still going to look to the left. And because of this, I see that, okay, I have one and one, but the fourth column also has a lowest one, right? That is conflicting with the current one. So I'm going to add four to it. So the fourth column is added to my current column. And again, it's one plus one equal to zero, one plus one equal to zero. So at the end of this, you get this matrix where the after added both column four and column five to this um, column six, you got all zero in that column, okay? And then this is what I call reduced matrix now. So I have now reduced my boundary matrix to this new matrix. And what I'm claiming is everything I just talked about in terms of the barcode is encoded by this matrix, okay? What does that mean? Now let's look at zero dimensional feature. Zero dimensional feature are born. Um, so, so what do you do here? is first of all, you look at the ones that is enclosed by ones, okay? So those lowest one that I didn't touch. The lowest one in those rectangles are the ones corresponding to finite features, meaning that the feature that has a burst time and a finite burst time and finite death time. So the row, the row index is its burst time, the column index is its death time. So what did this mean? This means there's a feature that is born at two and die and four, there's a feature that is born at three and die and five. This corresponding to precisely the two zero dimensional feature, right? Two, four, three, five, as I went through this process here. Now I care about the features that is probably born but never dies, right? Those corresponding to the empty columns, okay? So, well, of course, empty columns, you know, some of them is already paired, so you want to ignore them. So there's four empty columns. There's a first column, second column, third column, and the last column. But the, but the second column and the third column is already paired, so you kind of ignore them, right? Because they are born at this time, but they died at time four and time five. So yeah, so in some sense, they are already included as this first time. But then you see there's two more columns the first empty column and then the last empty column, they correspond to birth of a component one and never dies and birth and time six and never dies, right? And then of course the first three of them are zero dimensional feature and the last one is one dimensional feature. Okay, so that will conclude what I want to talk about today. To compute persistent homology, it's basically boiled down to column operation over matrices. And next lecture, we're going to go over two more examples. But how does this work uh, for, for your first project? You provide a point cloud, and then you provide a filtration, which is the ordering of the synthesis as the columns. What Ripser, well, actually what Ripser does is it takes the point cloud first and construct this filtration based on Rips filtration. And then it's going to compute the barcode as what I just did by doing those column operations. Okay? Of course, there are some optimization they did in the code to make it fast, but this is really the naive algorithm to compute persistent homology. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. So yeah. uh, why is this not considered a triangle? Oh, why is not a triangle? Yeah. Because this is, this, this simplicial complex only contain three vertices and three edges. There's no triangle in there. Oh, okay. The space, so this space as I drew is not the same as this space. 
those are two different simplicial complexes. Oh, I see. That's oh, okay, okay. Um, right, that makes sense. Okay, thank yeah. you. But you can actually push yourself, right? Let's say I want to do the persistent homology of this space. What's going to happen? I'm going to add a column in my column matrix to be seven. And seven is my triangle. And the boundary of the triangle The boundary of my triangle, so I'm going to add a column and a row, is going to be four, five, six. Okay. I believe this is my next example. Well, my next example is a little bit more complicated. Do I have another one? No. Yeah. So, so this will be an example you can play with, which is if I add the triangle in here, what is going to happen? What's going to happen is that it's going to have a tunnel that is a tunnel that is born at six and it's going to die at seven when the triangle comes back. Okay. All right, I'm gonna start streaming and people can ask me more questions.